Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, once again to this great initiative, our ISCB Student Council uh, webinars. Uh, today we have another great talk by Sergio Martinez uh, Cuesta from the University of Cambridge, and his talk is Genetic Interactions of G Quadruplexes in Humans. So thank you, Sergio, for being here with us and the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yusid. Yeah, fantastic. It's great to be here. And hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be presenting my research to you. So I, um, Yusid mentioned uh, this work was done at the University of Cambridge during my postdoc. Um, and then I recently joined a pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca, but uh, as I said, the work from today is uh, a work from from my from my postdoc. So, so we're going to be focusing on uh, genetic interactions of G quadruplexes. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, describing what uh, G quadruplexes are all about. Okay. Uh, so the research, just a little bit of a little context. The research is uh, based at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So. This is a very exciting place to do research uh, in the interface with the clinic. And uh, they are currently uh, building a new hospital for cancer. And then are also set up some uh, a hospital uh, being constructed at the moment for cardiovascular disease. And uh, we have also the classical uh, Adam Brooks Hospital and uh, the uh, university, of course, uh, very closely related to the biomedical campus and the um, uh, several headquarters of companies, for example, AstraZeneca and Upcam of some companies. So, you know, if you ever come to the UK, come and visit us in Cambridge. It's a very, very exciting place to to work. So this this was done uh, within the context of a very large team of uh, very talented colleagues uh, uh, based uh, both in the dry lab, so doing computational work, but also uh, in the wet lab, so chemists and biologists. And as you can see here, this is the Balasu Romanian group, where we were <clears throat> around 30 people at the time when, we, when I was there. And we had two sites, so we were based at the chemistry department here as shown on the left, and at the Cancer Research UK uh, on the biomedical campus uh, here on the right. And then it's a very wide mix of backgrounds, chemists, biologists, informaticians. Uh, and then in the cancer research UK, we're quite well supported also by a very good um, set of core facilities that uh, uh, without their help, we, we would have been able to generate some of the data sets that are going to be shown today. So uh, we are focused on trying to understand the mechanisms that lead to the chemistry and the structure of the genome. Uh, so as you, some of, many of you would know, the genome is not just about uh, ACGT, but rather you have more complex structures uh, happening there. So, so you have the, the very simple double helix that we've seen in some of our textbooks, but then We've been able to identify recently that there are other processes uh, affecting how the genome is packed and then how uh, the uh, structure of the genome uh, pans out. Uh, so on top of that, uh, from the fact that you have a DNA calling around uh, proteins known as histones, then you also have modifications happening in these histones. So for example, chemical changes to the proteins and also chemical changes happen to the DNA itself, or the most common one, and some of you might have heard, is called DNA methylation. And then these structures are called as nucleosomes, and then they further pack in 3D uh, in fibers known as chromatin, uh, which then uh, in higher order structures, they pack up uh, in 3D, forming what we know as the genome architecture, okay? So what we're, uh, we're interested in at the time when I was doing my postdoc is to try to understand the mechanisms of uh, modification and damage in DNA and RNA, 
So for example, in this uh, drawing, I'm showing you a mutation, right? A CTT mutation, uh, quite common in some uh, process of cancer. But then our focus was more on process of chemical modification. So you can change the, ba uh, the basis chemically without actually in involving a mutation. So you can add a methyl group here on the cytosine and then you uh, produce a 5-methyl cytosine, right? Uh, and then another focus of the remaining group was on understanding the uh, secondary structures that happen in, uh, in DNA. So here I'm showing you a structure of a G quadruplex, uh, which is composed of different planes of uh, one -ins. So of Gs, here I'm showing you one plane, so you can see four one -ins that are stabilized by a middle. And then the, the goal of the lab here was to try to understand both what is the function of the secondary structures in DNA and also what is the function and uh, functional implications of uh, the modifications uh, and damage in DNA and RNA, okay? So the wider context of where this research sits, it's within the areas of uh, trying to determine how uh, cancer and aging uh, develops. So we are focused on understanding the impact of genome instability uh, through DNA damage and uh, you know structures uh, in DNA, and also the impact of epigenetic alterations. And then how by mapping and developing new genomic methods to map modifications and structures, then we can understand more about how cancer uh, and aging um, have an impact. So, but today the focus is going to be on uh, G quadruplexes. So as I said, these are secondary structures in the genome. And then uh, all the way up, up, up until a few years ago, there wasn't a very clear understanding of what are the genes that are associated to G quadruplexes. Uh, so what, what I mean by association here is they could be direct binders or maybe indirect binders, part, part of complexes, or maybe genes that are involved in the regulation uh, of the G quadruplex in terms of maybe folding the G quadruplex or unfolding them, okay? So what we did in this study is to generate a genome wind as a training screen to be able to map uh, all possible genes that are associated to G quadruplexes, okay? And then we, uh, were, the focus of today is going to be all the bioinformatics work that went on there to basically go from all the 12 data sets that we had down to a few uh, significant genes that we could move forward for follow-up and understanding. So, so this piece of work was done in collaboration with um, very two talented uh, experimental uh, colleagues, Katie and Darcy, and uh, published in A-Life uh, a couple of years ago. So as I said, this is the structure of a G quadruplex. So you have uh, one plane of one ins, and then these planes, they stack, uh, stacked up on, on top of each other, forming a structure, okay? And yeah, so the goal here, it's uh, basically to systematically identify the, uh, the genes that promote uh, cell death. Uh, when we both silence the genes via shRNA silencing. And on top of that, we also stabilized the G quadruplex using a small molecule. So a small molecule that binds to the G quadruplex and then it stabilizes it so that uh, we can have more of this uh, present uh, in the genome. Uh, so these are two molecules that have been described in the literature to bind to G quadruplex, and then we use them in this study. So, so just to give a little bit of uh, the background of why we're doing this. So one idea is that you could, well, um, uh, silence a gene, so gene A. Uh, so therefore you will have uh, a protein A. And then we will, then we will lead that if if that protein A wasn't associated to G4 in any way, okay, upon stabilization with the G4 leave and the cell will still be viable, okay? Uh, however, a, a different mechanism will be, for example, a gene B that upon silencing, 
than if the relationship there is an association with the G quadruplex either by binding and unwinding or regulation. Then when you stabilize it, then if the gene is very important for that process, then there will be a lethal uh, interaction uh, and the cells uh, will die more and more often, okay? Uh, there might be circumstances here why the cells could be also be viable, but we're not going to go into detail uh, today. Here, this study was focused on these uh, lethal interactions that upon stabilization and knockdown, then you will see cell death, okay? Uh, so the methodology, is, uh, some of you might be familiar with the genome-wide SHRNA screens. So the idea is that, uh, you know, in each plasmid, you encode an SHRNA, and then you have these sort of big libraries of, of pl plasmids but that by, uh, you know, retro uh, retroviral pa packaging and infection, then you can uh, infect uh, human cell lines. So in this case, we use A375. Uh, so that you will end up with a knockdown event in each uh, human cell, okay? And then you can have an experimental design where you have a number of cells per pool, and then you could do population doublings and then treatment with untreated, and then a vehicle, molecule, DMSO, and also the uh, molecule FENDC3 and MPDS that stabilize the G quadruplex. And then you can think of and the idea ultimately is then to, you know, extract, uh, so to sequence, right, uh, these different pools of SHRNAs and then to do standard uh, processing of these uh, tools and then ultimately do counting of these uh, SHRNAs that remain uh, at the end. Uh, and then doing a statistic and analysis to compare PDS against T0 and then FENDC3 and then and T0 controlled by the fact that we have uh, the DMSO there as well, okay? So that's, that's the rationale of the uh, experiment. Uh, so ultimately, after having done these comparisons, what we're seeing is that if we, we see cell death before sensitization, then that would uh, link us that there is an association between the gene and the G quadruplex. Uh, same thing for if you have resistance, but as I said, uh, these um, uh, screens are actually set up because of the knockdown. They are se set up to understand sensitization uh, and not really resistance. So that's what we'll be focusing uh, from, from now on. So ultimately, if you think about it, so computationally, you end up with a matrix, okay, where you have all, all different conditions uh, with your replicates, and then you have all different pools of H SHRNAs because you can't do the experiments at one batch, but you have to do it in multiple pools. Uh, so you have with this matrix, and this, this is kind of your operating data set, right, for doing uh, comparisons uh, of the different uh, uh, treatments. And uh, so the, just to give everyone an overview, uh, in terms of processing the data, then uh, of course you do the alignment uh, to the libraries of SHRNAs that you've input into the human cells in the first place. And then once you've done the alignment and then the, the, the QC of the alignment, you do counting of these SHRNAs. You filter some SHRNAs that have low number of counts, and then you normalize by library size, as, as if you would do in other genomics uh, approaches. And then you do modeling, uh, where you uh, fit a generalized linear model to the counts based on the negative binomial distribution. Uh, okay. And finally, you do scoring. So you do, just like you do, for example, in RNA-seq, you can do the same thing for each SHRNA, and then you can do significant tests. And there are the new hypothesis that, for example, PDS and TC0 don't show any difference. Uh, and then downstream, multiple testing correction and volcano plots and thresholding to identify sets of SHRNAs that are uh, enriched. 
Uh, and then obviously you have the situation, this is something I probably should have mentioned earlier, is that uh, there, there can be situations where th there are multiple shRNAs targeting the same gene by, by the way that this technology works. So then you have to apply some filtering into the shRNAs that um, uh, basically uh, knock down the same gene. And then here we use these two parameters. So uh, if we have uh, three or more significant shRNAs targeting the same gene, then we follow that gene up. Or if we had a situation where more than 50% of the shRNAs came up uh, significant, then we also followed it, followed it up. Okay. And then downstream, then you can work with these gene lists, uh, so discovering, discovering new for associated genes, doing you know, pathway enrichment analysis, investigating whether there is an enrichment uh, in cancer genes, uh, etc. Okay, so yeah, as I said, so we have our 12 different pools, we filter these shRNAs, we combine them, and then we end up with a list of significant genes. So at the end of the day, you end up with this band diagrams. So you know, this is the PDS against T0, FENDC3 against T0, and then the MSO against T0. And uh, then you have uh, genes that are uh, unique to these conditions or genes that are shared. So, of course, for us, and knowing that the mechanism of action of PDS and FENDC3 is similar, then we were interested really on the genes that lie at the intersection between PDS and FENDC3, but they don't, they haven't been, uh, they haven't come up in the DMSO uh, control. Okay, so we are very interested here on these 107 uh, genes. Okay, so you can do further filtering. So from here to here, you, you can do a further filtering just on the fold change, and then you reduce the number of, of genes. So the first thing is the uh, is to do we, we, that we did here is to do some kind of confirmation analysis. So in the lab we have colleagues that have been working on the G quadruplex fields for for quite some time. So obviously one of the things that was reaffirming was the fact that some genes that have already been associated uh, to be uh, to G quadruplexes they came up uh, on the screen. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is, you know, the number of um, hairpins, the number of SHRNAs that were targeting the gene, how many came up depleted, uh, and then what was the um, the median uh, log to fold change, and then some some information uh, from the literature. So, for example, the BRCA1, BRCA2 pair. Uh, these are genes, cancer genes have very been, been very much related to breast cancer. They've been for some time been uh, known to be associated to uh, G quadruplexes. So uh, we, we, we found them and we, for, for the genes that we couldn't really make sense of them, then we did further database searches using Uniprod, Go, and then sort of bespoke databases, for example, this G4 IPDB, where uh, genes that are associated to G quadruplex, they have already been uh, curated uh, manually. And then that gave, gave us a level of annotation uh, on top of our manual uh, confirmation, okay? Uh, so we annotated the genes based on you know, G4 IPDB annotation or uh, their goal terms, uh, and then obviously just like before the, the literature. But then we wanted to go one level farther because there were still some of these 101 genes for which we couldn't really see an association uh, with G, G quadruplex. So the next level for us was to uh, text mine the literature. So we used uh, an algorithm called PolySearch2 uh, that uh, weights co-occurrence of uh, terms uh, in PubMed abstracts and open source um, full texts. And then it gives a score of whether two terms, uh, could it be, for example, G quadruplexes uh, and the name of a gene, how strongly they are associated according to the literature. Okay. 
So we use that in order to annotate our 101 genes by this PolySearch uh, score. And then the cool thing here was also that we were obtaining many PubMed entries that would further give us more details of what the association came about, right? So, so uh, very interestingly, there were some genes that hadn't been reported before to be associated with G quadruplexes uh, that we then followed up on uh, sort of downstream experiments. So overall, uh, when then uh, the next step was to take uh, these uh, 101 genes and then do pathway enrichment analysis and domain enrichment analysis and, and trying to make sense a little bit uh, more of that. And then the overall message that I came up from this investigation were five different pathways that uh, seem to be related to G quadruplexes. So you have the splicesome pathway and the ribosome pathway. Uh, in particular, there was some early evidence of the, pl the splicesome being associated with G quadruplexes, but not so much the ribosome. And this is something that we're currently doing some follow-up work. On what could be the relationship between you know, having a G quadruplex and then have, and having an impact on ribosomal processes. Uh, uh, there's some other terms, some of, there's some cancer genes that have to do with cell cycle and then that already had association with the G quadruplexes that also all came up. And then we have the DNA replication pathways as well and the ubiquitin mediated proteolysis. So, so that was um, interesting uh, as well. So we did that at the pathway level, but also we did similar um, enrichment analysis using Go, GAG, domain databases like CAF and PFAN, uh, but also uh, cancer gene databases in Cosmic so that we could annotate our data sets when whether they have been found in the gene, in the cancer gene sen census that is uh, manually curated by Cosmic or whether the genes that we picked up were involved in some key protein-protein uh, interactions uh, using string. Uh, overall, I think the most important bit, uh, bit was once we had this annotation was to sit down with our uh, biologist and then uh, design a focus screen with this uh, 101 uh, genes uh, and other positive and negative controls that we added to the mix. Uh, again, more focus, not genome-wide, uh, on the same cell line, A375, but also on an additional cell line, so that we could verify uh, some of our findings and then further narrow down the list to a handful of genes that then we could do more in-depth uh, experiments. And finally, so when we did this follow-up, then across all the comparisons and all the data sets, there were four key genes that appear all the time. Uh, so BRCA1, which, as I mentioned before, it's a gene has been already uh, being very well described uh, to have an association with G quadruplexes. And then we, given its importance, on breast cancer, we wanted to further uh, study that association. That was one thing. Then we discover a new LE case. So this is a protein responsible for finding, binding and G quadruplexes and unwinding them. Uh, that mechanism did, hadn't been reported before, but did we reported here for the first time. And then there were a particular another um, mechanism that it was very interesting was the top one which is a gene involved in to toposomerase uh, activity uh, basically to you know unwind dna and then relax the strain that gets into dna upon replication and then uh, it's interesting that this gene seems to be strongly associated with you quadruplex as well uh, we still haven't been able to describe whether there is a direct interaction with G quadruplexes or whether it's that uh, interaction via mediated uh, as part of a complex. Uh, but that's something uh, we, we need to follow up. And also uh, another relevant gene is uh, GAR1. Okay. 
So what we did as a follow-up is to do also, once we have identified these four genes, to do independent siRNA knockdowns to recapitulate that there was uh, inhibition of cell growth uh, induced by uh, the knockdown and the small molecule. And then our collaborators used uh, the cells and cell confluency uh, assays for this. Uh, and then uh, more interestingly, so looking back at the pathways, uh, there were several pathways involved in the cell cycle uh, where we identify, for example, the we one uh, kinase. And then in the ubiquitin-mediated proteolysis, there were also uh, uh, some the ubiquitinases uh, there. So what we did here, uh, in, again, in collaboration with uh, our experimental colleague, is to do a synergy study uh, via luminescence where you treat the cell both with the G4 molecule, or PDS, and then these inhibitors, MK1775 and pimozide. And then you see whether by giving the two drugs, then you induce cell death more often than you would expect if you give the two drugs uh, individually. Okay, so this is a, a synergy study. And indeed, uh, in these two examples, basically the addition of the two drugs, inhibitor and G quadruplex stabilization led to more uh, cell death, okay. Okay, so that's basically uh, the story that I wanted to tell you today. So yeah, so a big kudos to the colleagues in this Palace Romania group. Uh, as I said, it is a very talented group. It's been amazing to, to, to work with them uh, during my postdoc. Uh, so uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, we are based at the Cancer Research UK. We were very much grateful for all the funding, core funding and the core facilities that we have there. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so just yes, thank everyone in the Velasquez group. And then, if you have any questions about uh, the study, feel free to get in touch. Uh, here is my email address. Very happy to discuss if you have more more interesting, um, uh, you know, some some interesting questions or anything you want to talk about. Uh, and then, just a final acknowledgement to. Uh, at the university and the Cancer Research UK, our funding body, the Wellcome Trust, and I'm currently employed by a pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca. So if you also want to know more about moving from academia to industry, I'm happy to talk to you about that as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Sergio. Nice call. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. I just said, yeah. Hi. So um, let's wait for questions from attendees. But in the meantime, I have a couple of questions uh, uh, for you. So uh, Sergio, th th this kind of, of structures are, are natural in the, in, the, in the genome, right? Yeah. The thing is, when, 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 when you have the, the, the aberrant G4 formation, that's the problem. And then uh, these features will start uh, a particular disease or a particular uh, uh, cancer. So do, do, you, do you know if, if maybe this G4 formation, the, the, the ROM4 or the Abram form, is related with a particular cancer cases, is related with a particular cancer, for example, because I, 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 I saw that you were working with a particular genes that are related with breast cancer and any other kind of cancer is there a, a, a an enrichment in the in the in a particular uh, type of cancer yeah good point yeah uh, still the as the association between g quadruplexes and a particular type of cancer is something that is not very clear yet but there is there is a lot of work going on in the balasubramanian group but also in other groups to try to establish uh, that link uh, so just to give you a bit more of context, uh, there are technologies to be able to map uh, using ChIP-seq, antibody ChIP-seq, to be able to map uh, this G quadruplex genome-wide. And then there are multiple methods to, to do so. Um, so in terms of the 
quadruplex that can potentially form in the genome, we know that we have around 700,000 of the chi quadruplex that happen in the, in the human genome. And then when you do the chip seek experiment to really uh, narrow down the ones that are folded using an antibody, then that number significantly reduces up to around 10,000. Okay, so it looks like at a, at a given time, uh, there is only a fraction of the G quadruplex that unfold. And then they tend to be usually uh, present in promoters of genes. Uh, so there has been some follow-up uh, work at the moment by one of our colleagues, and this is a publication that's just about to come up on trying to understand whether given that uh, abundance of G quadruplex in the promoter of genes, if there is anything particular about these genes, and whether there is any relationship with things like transcri transcription factor binding uh, to the promoter. So yeah, that's uh, something uh, very interesting. Maybe <laughs> I can tell you guys more on, on the next uh, call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, uh, Sergio. So uh, 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 we can say that the impact of this G4 is more in the translation and transcription process than yes. in any other biological process? Yeah, it's mainly uh, what is known at the moment is uh, the impact in transcription, given the abundance uh, in the promoter flow genes. Having, having said that, uh, there are well-described G quadruplexes in uh, RNA as well, in mRNA. And uh, there is work trying to investigate whether there is any effect of having that structure, if there is any effect on the translation of a given mRNA. Uh, but it, still uh, nothing, uh, you know, solid yet in the literature. Yeah. Okay, so we, we can say that these, these structures are not related with uh, the novel mutations, for example, are not related. Uh, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, are you thinking about maybe if they are coming from like insertions in the genome and things like that? Or? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the moment, uh, uh, I don't think there has been a particular association. There, there has been a study where they've been linking G quadruplexes with uh, regions uh, of a large number of copy number variants. Okay. And where there is a relationship between the two. But um, yeah, I, I would have to have a look at it because it, it was a while. But there, definitely there are uh, overlaps uh, different from uh, our group uh, looking into that. Yeah. Okay, cool, Sergio, thank you. So, okay, we don't have uh, any questions from attendees, but at, as Sergio said, if you have questions, please get in touch with Sergio by email. So once again, thank you. Sergio for being here with us. Uh, we hope you 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 back again in, in a future call and thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. That was a pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. And thank you all for being here with us today. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks everyone.